What is Zionism? How did it emerge? What do they want from Jerusalem? Why do they especially want to establish a state there? I am about to share something that many people are unaware of or haven't even realized yet. Did the Palestinians sell land to the Jews? All the people in the world are slaves of the Jews. Therefore, there is also a reward for killing them. Why? They seized the properties of Jews. Theodor Herzl offered Sultan Abdul Hamid saying, let us pay off all the debts of the Ottoman Empire so that you will no longer have any debts. Abdul Hamid said to them, no, never ever. Those lands were conquered with blood and only can be given with blood. What is Judaism? Can you give us some information about its history? From the sons and descendants of Prophet Yaqub came the Jews. This was the case until the time of Prophet Musa. The pursuit of Prophet Musa and his people by the Pharaoh, their escape and the splitting of the sea. Allah promised the people of Israel, the Israelites, the land between the Nile and the Euphrates rivers. So they had to fight a war. They had to fight the people of that region. And in times of the Prophet Musa, these Israelites were afraid to fight the people of that region. They said to Prophet Musa, go with your Lord and fight. They are a merciless tribe. How are we going to fight them? Prophet Musa would conquer Jerusalem. He said to them, let's go. Inshallah, we will conquer it in a very short time. We will conquer and settle there. This is the land Allah promised us. But when they refused to fight, they were exiled to the Sinai Desert and wandered there. The conquest of Jerusalem wasn't destined for Musa. After Prophet Musa, it was granted to Prophet Yusha to conquer Jerusalem. And Prophet Yusha made many great conquests there. Of course, that generation was over. I mean, instead of those who wandered in the desert for 40 years, there were new generations. And Prophet Yusha set out on conquests with the new generation and achieved great victories there. Thus, the Israelites, the Jews, settled in that promised land. Of course, later Prophet Dawud established a state and created a governmental structure. He was both a prophet and a ruler. After Prophet Dawood, Prophet Suleiman established the greatest state in the world history. During his period, it is said that he ruled the world. A huge state known as the Kingdom of Judah emerged. Of course, Prophet Suleiman built a temple in Jerusalem, which we know as the Temple of Prophet Suleiman. After a while, the Israelites, they crossed the line, as it is described in the Quran, at some point they murdered the prophets that were sent to them. On that, Allah said to the Israelites in the Quran, and we warned the children of Israel in the scripture, you will certainly cause corruption in the land twice and you will become extremely arrogant. When the first of the two warnings would come to pass, we would send against you some of our servants of great might. This is what Allah said in the Quran. I mean, when we look at this from the historical perspective, this is the part where historians interpret that it is in line with the Quran. There was a Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, known as Bukht Nasar amongst Arabs, this ruler started to haunt the Jews. He entered Jerusalem with his strong armies and put all Jews to the sword and destroyed the temple of Suleiman and gathered and took away all remaining Jews to Babylon. In fact, this was the first time that the Jews were driven out of Jerusalem. I mean, he also destroyed the Torah, the original Torah when he burned down the temple of Suleiman. Now this is the first corruption the Jews caused, as it is stated in the Quran, and a great calamity fell upon them and they were driven out of their land. Later, the Persians began to rise in that region, which caused the fall of the Babylonian Empire. After the fall of the Babylonian Empire, the Jews who were taken to Babylon were relocated to Jerusalem. And when the Jews resettled in Al-Quds, this caused them to establish an ancient friendship with the Persians. Since the Jews are a nation very attached to their history, they say, the Persians returned our country back to us. That's why they love the Persians, the Iranians, and again, as it is stated in the Quran, the second corruption, it says, we would send against you some of our servants of great might who would ravage your homes. When we look at the history of this period, Allah knows the best. It is associated with the Roman Empire. There was an emperor of the Roman Empire called Titus. He was a cruel ruler, but the same things happened again. The Israelites killed their prophets, and then again, a great calamity came over them because they built their state on oppression, and their oppression caused them to go through a great calamity after some time. This calamity was the attack of the Romans. They started a rebellion. Of course, this was after they killed the prophets. And because of the rebellion, the Romans had had enough. At that time, the Romans controlled Syria and they had enough of the Jews. This is a general characteristic of Jews. They stir up trouble, they sow chaos, they turn people against each other and they cause disturbance. I mean, this is one of the many reasons why they are a cursed tribe. They never rest. When we look at the course of history, the Roman emperor put all the Jews into the sword again. This time, the Jews went through an exile that they call the Jewish diaspora. Romans chased the Jews from everywhere. Some of them fled to Yemen, others scattered through the Arabian regions, a part of them went to Russia, and some of them went to Iran. 
They fled to every place in the world, even Africa. They spread all over the world. And for over 2,000 years from that time, the Jews never dominated Jerusalem. Now in the following parts of the verse, Allah says, in other words, he threatens to bring them into line. It is prohibited for the Jews to establish a state, and in fact, for a long time, they couldn't establish one for themselves. Following the Roman Emperor Titus's chasing them away from Jerusalem, they were scattered to all corners of the world in 70 BC. If you cause corruption again, Allah is enough for you. When Rome chose Christianity, it became a huge trouble for the Jews because they hated the Jews. Why did the Christians hate them? Well, you know, Prophet Jesus. The Romans crucified him, but in the Islamic doctrine, he ascended to the heavens. He did not die. He switched places with one of his apostles, the one who betrayed him. Therefore, the Romans, I mean Christians, thought that it is because of the Jews, because we didn't know about religions back then. So we didn't know the religions, and you made us kill Prophet Jesus. Because you said that this man is a traitor, this man does this, does that. Because of these slanders by Jews, Romans thought that the Jews caused the death of Prophet Jesus. Think about it. If someone or people caused the prophet you believe in to be killed, you would have a grudge against them since you are a member of that religion. That's why the Jews are hated all around the world, especially where the Christians reside. They went through a lot of trouble because of Christians, and they didn't let Jews hold any office in the state, and they didn't let them be in military positions in any way. They were kept away from many fields. They were kept out and treated as if they were subhuman. The Jews have indeed fallen into great humiliation, and it lasted for many, many years. However, since many fields were closed to the Jews during these long years, they could employ themselves in antiques and junk dealing. They also joined the trade and studied in the fields of science. They focused on these two fields unwillingly, having no other choice. There was no option for them to hold office in the state or any other occupation. So they started scrapping old stuff. And they started to collect the scraps of other people, collecting the scraps and selling them. They started to work as scrap dealers and then they traded antiques. After a while, they started to collect and sell more valuable items after dealing with antiques, they advanced and became goldsmiths, expanding their trade. Goldsmiths started to do jewellery and trading in that occupation. Some of them have made great advances in science. In other words, they advanced their knowledge in the field they studied. The European societies allowed them to be only in these specific fields. After some period of time, you started to see Jews in every goldsmith. When you went to jewellery, you almost saw that it was owned by a Jew. This development led Jews to become extremely rich. They became the richest people in the world. As Eternal Passenger, we need your support. We are an organization of women volunteers who aim to spread the message of Islam all over the world. Our videos have helped thousands of people change their lives, convert to Islam, give up haram, start praying, wear hijab, learn to read the Quran. By donating through the thanks button and becoming a member of this family by clicking the join button, you can have your share in all these good deeds. Donate to Eternal Passenger. Well, if the Jews are so rich, what do they want Jerusalem for? Why do they especially want to establish a state there? Is there something we don't know? I am about to share something that many people are unaware of or haven't even realized yet. The Jews are very attached to their holy book and religion. Their insistence on Al-Quds was actually a utopia for them. The Jews that were scattered after the Roman period were humiliated so much. I mean, other nations humiliated them. The reason for their humiliation was not because they were oppressed. I mean, they caused trouble wherever they went. In fact, the Europeans were sick of the Jews and what they did. Theodor Herzl, a journalist from Europe, realized that the richest people in Europe were Jews. Of course, at that time, the period that man lived, I mean, during the reign of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism in Europe. If a Jew commits a crime, he would be exposed. There was serious racism with statements like, all Jews should be killed. I mean against the Jews. Theodor Herzl grew up in this environment and was affected by these events very much. He set his mind to... The Jews will be able to establish a state again. He set his mind to this dream, and he started to establish connections with rich Jewish families at that time. He began to meet with them and wrote a book called as Der Stadt, which means the Jewish state. In this book, he claimed that, that the Jews had the necessary power, wealth, and personnel to establish a state. So in his own way, he demonstrated to the Jews that a Jewish state could be established. And in Judaism, the world and everything in it belongs to the Jews. What is written in their own holy book is that all the people of this world, all non-Jewish people, are slaves of the Jews. Therefore, there is also a reward for killing them. Why? Because they seized the property of the Jews. With the gold they hold and the land they own, they are usurping the land and the property of the Jews. 
In fact, they don't just want Jerusalem or the land between the Nile and Euphrates. They want the whole world, and according to them, the whole world is theirs, and the capital of the world is Jerusalem. So they want to dominate the land between the Nile and Euphrates as their center. What is Zionism? How did it emerge? Theodor Herzl organized a Zionist Congress with Jews in Basel, Switzerland. And here, first, they decided the name of the state would be Israel, the state of the Israelites, and the flag of the state was also drawn there, the star of Dawud in between two stripes, the star of Prophet Dawud. I mean, after Yusha alayhi salam conquered Jerusalem, it was Prophet Dawud who established a country there. This is just a reference to that. That star of the Dawud means we will re-establish a Jewish state here. Those two stripes refer to the Nile and Euphrates rivers. The source of the mischief making is this. Because they see themselves as a superior race, above everyone else, they look down on the whole world and they hate everybody. I mean, Muslims are not the only target here. They hate Christians too. They hate the whole world and they think their property has been usurped. Think about it. Your religion teaches you something like this. All of this was yours. This and this came and seized your property. How dare they seize my property? I need to get them back. I need to take the whole world back. This is their core belief. When and how did the Jews decide to go to Palestine? Of course, Theodore Herzl didn't set his eyes on Jerusalem in the beginning. They first discussed whether to settle in Argentina. Because the Rothschild family has vast lands in Argentina, they could have founded a state on those lands. But they didn't accept this idea. Since Jerusalem was their ancient city, they said, what are we going to do in Argentina? So they said, we need to go to Jerusalem, and this state should be established there. So they've reached this decision, because for almost all of their history, they were in Jerusalem. They believe that those lands are promised by Allah to them. Therefore, they wanted to go to those lands. That's why Theodore Herzl, after the decision, though, of course, who held those lands at that time, the Ottoman Empire, and at that time, Sultan Abdul Hamid II was in the reign. Theodore Herzl had great power with the richest Jews backing him. He visited the Ottoman Empire a couple of times. In fact, five, according to the visitation records of the palace, met with Sultan Abdul Hamid and made a really profitable offer to the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans just came out of the war with the Russians, and at that time, the empire was trying to recover itself and pay its debts. Theodore Herzl made an offer to Sultan Abdul Hamid and said, we will cover all the debt of the empire. You will have no debt to anybody. I mean, think about how much wealth they had. They were wealthy to such a degree that they could pay all the foreign debt of the Ottoman Empire. Imagine how much they have. And he said, give us land from Jerusalem so that we can establish a state. This is how he asked in the beginning. Sultan Abdul Hamid was already aware of this danger. The Jews establishing a state there. I mean, when he discussed this matter with his pashas, if they established a state, there would be bloodbath. So he already knew what could happen and was aware of the situation. He knew the history of the Jews. He knew the Holy Quran. He knew that the Jews were always the number one enemy of Muslims. And they wouldn't want anything good to happen to Muslims. And they would cause corruption. Abdul Hamid said no to this offer. Never ever. Those lands were conquered with blood, he said diplomatically. Without revealing his real intention, he said that those lands were captured by blood and can only be given by blood. Also, he said, those lands don't belong to me, they belong to my people. I can't give you those lands. Again, he said all this in a diplomatic way. After this, he immediately issued an edict prohibiting anybody from selling land to the Jews around Al-Quds and Palestine. In other words, anticipating that they would try to do something by taking land from there, piece by piece, over this name, over that name, he prohibited it. In an article, Theodor Herzl said, In order to establish a Jewish state, we have to wait for the fall of the Ottoman Empire. This is a very interesting saying. What do we understand from this? The Jews were strong and decided to establish a state and made up their mind about toppling the Ottomans. As long as the Ottoman Empire doesn't withdraw from there, we can't do anything. Then, these Jews did everything in their power to the make the Ottoman Empire fall. The very first thing they did was to approach the British. Because the superpower of that period, both at land and sea and politically, was in the hands of the British. Thus, in exchange for financial support, the Jews reached an agreement with the British and they received the guarantee that after the Ottomans, Palestine and Al-Quds would be given to them. Consequently, Sultan Abdul Hamid was overthrown. We joined World War I and on the Palestinian front of World War I, as you know, we had a defeat against the British. From that moment on, when the British captured Palestine, they respected their agreement with the Jews. Because their financial source came from the Jews, Zionists, who had considerable money. Interestingly, the United Kingdom hadn't done anything like this for any other country, but they did it for the Jews. They called for any Jews from Europe who wanted to go to Palestine. 
Then the Balfour Declaration was announced. It is that famous minister's declaration. In this declaration, it is said, a land without a people for a people without a land, aiming to dissipate the dislike towards the Jews. They also had all the media power. They provoked everyone against Sultan Abdul Hamid and they toppled him. They tried to create sympathy towards the Jews in Europe. They came up with ideas that these people were oppressed and that they also had the right to establish a state. They gradually began to settle Jews in Palestine. From this point on, the Jews began to settle in Palestine and the British soldiers were patrolling the land. Why? They protected the Jews just in case any Muslim or other group wanted to harm them. So, the British soldiers protected the life, honor, and property of the Jews there to not let any harm come to the Jews. In a sense, so the Jews could continue to emigrate there, but not many Jews chose to go there. Yes, they thought, we can establish a state. Yes, we can reach our goal. Many Jews didn't believe this. After almost 2,000 years of captivity and humiliation, we can't re-establish a state or gain strength. This felt like a dream to them. I mean, I'm talking about the people, not the people in power. Many ordinary people didn't want to bother themselves. Think about it. You have your business and you are settled. You have a certain life and accommodation in Europe. You will give up all of these and go to Palestine. You will start a new life there from scratch. The Jews didn't want this. Therefore, there was not much immigration to Palestine. So what British and Zionism, and by Zionism I mean Theodor Herzl and the inner circle, wanted, it didn't happen. Jews didn't go there. In a way, they thought, they are betraying our cause. They felt a kind of resentment. We call them to the land that is promised to us, and they won't come. Nobody wanted to discomfort themselves. After a while, this thing, this cause has been forgotten. Many centuries have passed. There was this anger in the Zionist leadership against the Jews, who had forgotten their cause. While things were like this, something happened. The Nazi party was founded in Germany, and the First World War was over. So, the goal of Zionism then was to attract all Jews to Palestine and create a crowd, a population there, and establish a state. The British also provided all kinds of political support. The Zionists supported the British financially, and they gave political and military support to Zionists, because the Jews had no military power. So, the Jews had tremendous support in those lands. I mean, if they went, the state would be established, but they didn't. However, in a twist of history, fate smiled upon the Jews. A Nazi party was established in Germany, and its leader, Adolf Hitler, was a fierce enemy of the Jews, and he vowed to eradicate all Jews from the face of the world. He captured all of Europe in a short time and ordered concentration camps to be built. He was the worst enemy of Jews and gathered them and let all sorts of torture happen, including burning them alive. This actually worked in favor of Zionism. Why? Because all those Jews who feared Hitler's tyranny thought they couldn't survive in Europe. And as you know, Hitler attacked Russia as well, so those Jews from Russia thought the same. While Jews from different parts of the world were looking for some place to escape from this fear of Hitler, a statement was issued throughout Europe. What was in this statement? That for every Jew who moved to Palestine, they will be given land and millions in money. As long as they moved to Palestine, this information was distributed on leaflets. Of course, the fear of Hitler was the actual reason that drove them out. Because, we are being slaughtered here, we need to escape. Where will we go? To Palestine. That way, people started to emigrate to Palestine from Europe in large numbers by ship. After the emigrations, there was a large Jewish population in Palestine. Surely, Hitler was done for, and after this time, the population goal was reached to obtain the lands. Since those lands were under British governance, there was an issue of seizing those lands. Because those lands actually belonged to Palestinians, there were already people living there. I mean, those lands were not empty. In the Ottoman period, Palestinians, our Muslim brothers and sisters, were living in that region. At this point, one can ask, did Palestinians sell land to Jews? Once the Jews started to settle in this area, they disguised their intentions. They looked so innocent. This was the case for the Palestinians. None of the Palestinians thought, they will come here, they'll establish a state, and they'll displace us. The Palestinians didn't have an idea like that. Because, considering the history, the Palestinians thought these people went through a great deal of oppression in Europe, and they tried to kill all the Jews. These oppressed Jews had to come here and take refuge here. The Palestinians actually evaluated the situation from a very humanitarian point of view. There were even those who helped them. Think about it. As a Muslim, you extend a hand to the oppressed people. Whether he was an infidel or not, you help him. Because they were persecuted, they were separated from their homes, and they came all the way there. These initial thoughts of Palestinians make me emotional. I mean, they didn't know what was going to happen. Later, the Zionists literally wanted to buy land from Palestinians. And for instance, if the value of the land was one unit, they offered 10 units. The law of Sultan Abdul Hamid, the one that prohibited the selling of land to the Jews in 1914, 
was abolished by the Committee of Union and Progress, a political party. In other words, selling land had been legalized there. What Palestinians did was also legitimate. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed, they were gone, but there wasn't also a Palestinian state there, so it was not clear what was going on. The Ottoman Empire withdrew from there. There was the British mandate. Even before the selling of land, there was an occupation. The coastline was under occupation. Okay, these Jews came here in desperation. Maybe they'll go back when things get better in Europe. This was the perspective of the Palestinians. Let's help them, let's do something for them. From the very beginning, they did not think it was right to sell land. Now, let's take Turkey as an example. If someone tells us, sell us your land in the countryside or village, and we will give you an apartment from the most central location in Istanbul. In fact, we will give you not one, but two or three apartments. Who wouldn't think of selling? What do people think about the land in the village? What is it to me? The fields are worthless. The man is offering several times as much. With this amount of money, I can do this, buy that. They appealed to people's selves. Yes, there were Muslims who sold land there. Those who sold land there constitute a very small part of all people. You can find these sorts of people everywhere. For instance, today we boycott Israeli products. However, there are people who don't, right? Yes, you can find them in any country. So there were these sorts of people in Palestine as well. There are various rumors. It is said that 1% of the land was sold and 10% of the land was sold. Even if it was sold, does that justify the massacre they go through today? Of course not. However, the majority of the people opposed to the selling of land because those lands have always been accepted as holy. While Muslims were accommodating those lands, even if it was for helping a Jew, since they gave them land near the coastline to live on, Muslims didn't have to give more land. That's what most of them thought. I'm pretty sure that if those who sold land knew that there would be an Israeli state, they would drive the Palestinians out and only Jews would remain there. That's why they are buying this much land. If someone had said this to them, I believe most of them wouldn't have sold their land, no matter what they get in exchange. So, when did Muslims who lived there realize the real purpose of the Jews and what happened after this realization? For instance, did the Six-Day War happen during this period? Now it is like this. Since the Jews went there, they didn't live peacefully. A Jewish organization named Haganah was founded by the British. They thought, we are going to establish a Jewish state here, but we need armed forces. To be a state, we need an army. The Haganah organization is the basis of the Israeli army. They also committed outrages there. Zionism restored the forgotten language, Hebrew. They tried very hard to establish their connection to that old alphabet and create a sense of nation. And how many years it goes on? Let's say it's 1918. It goes on for 30 years. So during those 30 years, there were many developments and that was when the Muslims started to realize. It was when the Jewish people started to arm themselves because they realized that their goals were different. They realized the Jews came there permanently. They came for occupation. From that moment on, the Palestinians woke up and the selling of land stopped. No more compromise in any way was made, and against those armed Jews in the Haganah organization, Palestinians started to take up arms. There were armed conflicts. The conflicts resumed until 1948, and the British had a military presence and protected the Jews completely. The Jews were fighting with the confidence that the British soldiers were at their back. In fact, it is exactly the same thing today. They attack Gaza, and the American Navy immediately comes to support them. It was the same then. They attacked with the British soldiers at their back. If the British soldiers were withdrawn, we'd see if they could survive there. I need to add that mainly the British forces suppressed these clashes and in an unfair way. This is my boy. This is the naughty boy. They break up the fight. They're angry on the surface. But behind the scenes, they're saying, well done. By 1948, the Jews there had established all the organizations and announced to the whole world that they had established a state called Israel. The state they established encompasses Palestine completely. In other words, they revoked the rights of the Palestinian people. Palestinians said, we live here, but we didn't establish a state. This is a problem, and it needs to be solved. What will happen to our people? This problem is the same problem that continues today. In 1948, they established the State of Israel, and I believe it was six minutes later, the United States of America declared that they recognized the State of Israel. So what do we understand from that? America was already informed about the establishment of the State of Israel. As soon as they declared the State of Israel, all Muslim Arab states around Israel declared war. Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt. It was actually obvious that these countries would declare war on Israel. By the way, Israel was willing to fight them. We are still in 1948. They couldn't have established their governmental organization in such a short time. I mean, it is not possible to have it in an instant. It means that they had planned this a long time ago. You know, we are talking about the period of Sultan Abdul Hamid. They had planned this back then. Their organizational structures were planned beforehand. Who would hold office and where? 
because in such a short time, they became a full-fledged state. All of a sudden, there were educational institutions. It's almost like a ready-made pack. Again, these plans were made a long time ago. America recognized the country within six minutes without receiving any news. That's how we know it. It's all part of a plan. Israel had the full support of the United States, the United Kingdom, and Europe. As it is today, so was that day. They said that Israel won against all of the Arab countries, but it's far from the truth. If Israel had entered into a war alone, it would have had no chance against those countries of that day, but they had the most powerful armies at their back. They received all kinds of support. Their intelligence activities were very strong. Those states collapsed within, and there were a lot of tricks and maneuvers and intelligence activities, and the naval, air, and land support of America and the UK caused the defeat of these states at the same time. And there had always been wars at such intervals. You know, there was a huge war in 1967 and another one in 1973. The Arab countries of that region had been at war with Israel constantly, and it has always been the Arabs who have suffered from the war, because they have exhausted all of their powers. I mean, their organizational structures crumbled during these wars, as if Israel was deliberately pulling them on itself. As if they were saying, come on, come to me, I'll destroy your power. You want a piece of me? I'll destroy your power too. I mean, Egypt was a great power then, and they finished Egypt. They collapsed all the military power of Egypt. Iraq's fate was the same. This is where we are always wrong. The land between the Nile and the Euphrates is in danger. We think that there is no danger for other places. You know, some parts of Turkey are within those lands, within the border of the Euphrates. But we are wrong. As I said before, they want the whole world, and to take over the whole world. They use power of the US tilt to this day, and they will continue to use it. Will this turmoil in the Middle East continue? How will it end? There is an anecdote mentioned in Masnawi. There was a scholar, sort of a saint in a country. This person was a person of charity who donated a lot. He used to borrow a lot of money from tradesmen. He spent all of the borrowed money on good deeds. He trusted Allah. Allah has granted him with wealth and sustenance, and he paid all his debts with them. He has never encountered any problems. One day he got sick and fell on his deathbed. It was a serious illness. People came to visit the saint in his home, but most of those who came to visit were the ones he owed money. I mean, they actually wanted to ask for their debt, in a sense. They were talking among themselves about how they couldn't ask for their money back from someone on his deathbed. The saint heard them. They were talking. He owed me this much. He owed me that much. Now, who will cover for this? How will it be? The saint was grieved by this situation. He said, a saint, a scholar, is passing away. You know how they say, the death of a scholar is the death of the world. It is something significant. He thought, instead of feeling sorry for losing a saint, for the passing away of a friend of Allah, they are after their money. At that moment, a child passed by outside. He was a dessert maker and was selling holwa. When the child passed by, he said to his disciple, call for the child. They called the child. He said, give everyone from your dessert. Then the child handed out to everyone some dessert. Everyone ate it. Of course, all the dessert is finished. The boy was happy because he finished all the dessert. He didn't have to walk around trying to sell it. He thought he can go to his master with a full day's sale. He wanted the money from the saint for the dessert. He said, there is no money. The child was surprised. What does it mean there is no money? Where is the money? I just handed out the dessert. Everyone ate it. The saint said, there is no money, just go. When he said that, the child started to cry. On this time, the tradesman started to grumble. He has no money. On the way out, he took the money of the child as well. He did the same thing to us. After the boy started to cry, the men became enraged. Seeing them enraged, the boy slammed his tray to the ground and started, What am I going to say to my master? I've spent all my whole war. He'll ask me, What have you done to them? He will say to me this and that. The boy's wailing took the place down. Just then, someone knocked on the door. They opened the door. Who is it? The saint asked. Who is it? A man entered saying, A Muslim sent you his zakat. How much money does this saint owe to all those people, including the dessert? 4,000 liras. He asked, how much money is there in the zakat? Is it 4,000? For instance, with today's currency, there are 4,000 liras. He said, give everyone their due. Pay for the child's money as well. He said to everyone, now leave. Of course, everybody understood that it was a miracle of Allah, they said. What did we do? We disrespected the great saint. When everyone felt embarrassed, the saint said to them, so what is the wisdom of this? This money would come to me eventually. It was predestined. This blessing would be granted to us by Allah, but its time had been postponed. There was some more time. When you started to talk about my debts, when you started to talk against me, just so you shouldn't gossip or backbite, this child came to my rescue. I bought this boy's sweets. When I didn't pay, he started to cry. The cries of this child hastened the deliverance of this money. And it arrived just on time. I've given your money. Now, leave, and I'll take my leave of you. 
Just as this kid's cries brought the blessing of Allah forward, the acts of persecution result in bringing Allah's wrath forward in the same way. So these cries of the kids in Gaza today, the cries of the children, the cries of the martyred people will cause the wrath of Allah to come swiftly. The more they oppress people, the calamity will find them more quickly. And inshallah, soon we will all see that Israelites and the state of Israel can no longer survive with the oppression they cause. As Allah said in the Holy Quran, He said that there was the first corruption and there was the second corruption and there is a third one. He said, if you cause corruption again, I'll defeat you. There is Zionist corruption all over the world that the Israelites cause and innocent civilians of Gaza pay the ultimate price. And I hope and firmly believe that very soon a great calamity will fall upon the state of Israel and the state of Israel will collapse. And inshallah, this will happen at the hands of the Muslims. May our Lord bestow us to see those days.